Good evening. My name is Bob Liff, and this is the CUNY Forum, a monthly town meeting that brings prominent New Yorkers together with faculty and students of the Edward T. Rogowski Internship Program in Government and Public Affairs. The constant and the chaotic and erratic administration of the former resident of Fifth Avenue, who now sits in the White House, has been the demonization and scapegoating of immigrants, especially non-white immigrants who do not hail from his preferred sources of immigration, like Norway. The most recent example is the, is the administration's unilateral redefining of the process by which refugees seek asylum, a traditional means by which this country established its self-proclaimed mantle as the last best hope from, for humankind by welcoming the world, in the words of the, of the poem on the base of the Statue of Liberty, the tired, the poor, the teeming masses yearning to breathe free. Of course, Trump's immigration director even tried to redefine the words on that poem to say it meant nothing of the sort. Whether it's the border wall he is stripping military funding to build, the caging of children as part of the policy of separating families arriving at our southern border, or the raid on a Mississippi chicken processing plant that seized hundreds of undocumented workers but somehow failed to take action against the employer who hired them, we're in the midst of a long-suppressed nativism and, and uh, xenophobia that has been resurrected in the service of Trump's attempt to win re-election next year. And the administration has taken special aim at next year's census, trying to get around court decisions barring them from adding a citizenship question. What, that was widely seen as an attempt to dissuade undocumented residents from participating in order to cost Democratic cities in particular representation and, and federal funding based on a constitutionally mandated count of all residents not just citizens. The costs are immense, both in human terms and economically, especially in this immigrant-heavy city, which despite the anti-Trump and pro-immigrant policies of the day in this city, has not been immune to some of those negative views of immigration and immigrants. One of our guests today argues in a book that immigration in New York demonstrates are two fundamental traits, economic dynamism and human diversity that, quote, has made us a city that inspires dreams and sparks conflict, but frustrates efforts to establish enduring levels of order and general prosperity, unquote. We're joined today by four New Yorkers who have taken part in the debates over immigration and the economic, humanitarian, and political implications of that debate. Catalina Cruz is a member of the New York State Assembly from Queens, representing immigrant-heavy neighborhoods including Corona, Elmhurst, and Jackson Heights, and was herself an undocumented immigrant, a so-called dreamer, who arrived from Colombia as a child with her family. J.C. Polanco is a Bronx lawyer, activist, and Republican Party leader, albeit a never-Trumper let me hasten to add, who was also an adjunct professor at CUNY's Borough of Manhattan Community College. David Reimers is a professor emeritus of history at New York University, is a co-author of that aforementioned and recently updated book, All the Nations Under Heaven, Immigrants, Migrants, and the Making of New York. And Felipe de la Jose is a reporter specializing in analyzing immigration and is co-founder of a valuable new blog called Borderlines, focusing on the issue. David, let me start with you. In the book, um, there's a rather remarkable chart. I think it was in 1990, Russia, Italy, European countries were the primary source of immigrants in this city. And now you have to go way down the list before you come to the first European country. I think it's ninth out of a top ten. What does that tell us? Well, for one, the law changed. That's a big factor. And without changes in the law, you wouldn't see a shift. I mean, it's changes in laws, not just the 1965 Immigration Act, which is in some ways was restrictive. But as those laws changed, they tended to open the door more just at about the time when the European economies had fully recovered from the war and Europeans are no longer wanting to come to the United States. Uh, but, after the fall of the Soviet Union, however, a number of Poles and Russians and so forth did begin to come again, but Europeans represent only 10 percent or less uh, of our uh, immigrant pool. Uh, at the same time, because uh, of globalization and the sense that the United States is a, a country of opportunity and certainly American culture through television, travel, what have you, it's been uh, spread all around the world. Other people want to come to the United States, and they have uh, so chosen to do so. We have a backlog, about 4 million people wanting to get into the United States today. So the desire to come, obviously, is still there. That's 4 million people wanting to come legally. Legally, right. Um, Catalina, you're one of those new 
um, type of immigrants. I mean, your family came from Colombia. You were a dreamer. You were an undocumented immigrant um, as you were as you were growing up. This is a personal issue to you, not only you know to your district, but but to you. No, absolutely. Look, I I understand that that need to flee a country where. Uh, where you have war, where you have poverty. That's the reason why my mom decided to pack everything and leave. You know, she was a middle class uh, working nurse and packed up everything because the country was so dangerous. So when we have folks coming to our border doing something that's under international legally uh, you know, permissible, and, and you see people trying to do exactly what my mom did for me, and instead we have our government turning around and putting these kids in cages, it angers me, it worries me, and it makes me want to work that much harder for people. In, in our community, you know, right now, just today, I had uh, two of my constituents. Uh, one, her son got picked up by immigration uh, on his way to court to actually face the law. They picked him up, and then I had another one who has to come into her homework in my office because she's so afraid that if she goes home, immigration is going to show up to her house and pick her up, and so. These are the lives of, of the people in my district, where 60% of them are born in another country and 40% of them don't have permanent status. Many of them are undocumented. So for me, this is not just about the people that I represent. These, this is for, for, for the mothers like mine, for the children like me who are still living in the shadows. Felipe, um, in your first blog post, it's, it's a new blog, Borderlines, I recommend you all take a look at it. Um, you quote, a, you quote an immigration official who was speaking to the Houston Chronicle saying the administration is trying to just throw spaghetti up on the wall and see what will stick. They're trying right. all kinds of things. One of them, and the most recent one, of course, is the unilateral redefinition of asylum, that you have to apply in an intermediate country if you're coming from Central America, which the largest number of people are. Um, but, just as, but just as Catalina said, you know, her mother brought her here because they were fleeing poverty, they were fleeing, they weren't kind of a classic definition of, um, of what asylum was. Right, yeah, no, and I, I mean, I think that the asylum ban, is, you know, as it's called, is very indicative of the, the tactics that the administration is using, which is that they have certain statutory power, you know, under the law, and they just take, you know, whatever thing they can you know grab onto and expand that way beyond any kind of intended definition uh, you know once a particular law was passed so with the asylum man for example there's something in the law that says that you know it is possible that there is if there's a safe other country that somebody could have uh, you know gotten asylum in prior to arriving in the United States that's possible but that that's only ever been done with specific you know bilateral agreements like the one we have with Canada it's never been no one's ever tried to do it in this kind of broad based way but they they kind of will throw that at the wall. They know it's going to get tied up in court and, and <clears throat> sort of just the, the agglomeration of all these different things that, you know, it's a combination of the fact that the executive does have a lot of latitude with immigration matters specifically and that Congress hasn't, you know, been, been unable able to act in any way. That's kind of, you know, there's just tons of things coming down the pike almost every week and, and kind of collectively they're what some immigration attorneys and others that are kind of observing this will call sort of the invisible wall, like the, some of these objectives have, have been achieved by rulemaking as opposed to policy making at the at Congress. JC, the politics of this is a mess. Um, is. You and I have been around politics for a long time. Yep. Um, in particular in the Bronx where you are, yep. which is an immigrant heavy borough. Um, it seems clear to me that, you know, and, and we're in New York City, we are you know, kind of an island of tolerance, if you will. Yep. One of the points that uh, David makes, uh, he quotes somebody in his book saying, the question is, will New York's tolerance spread to the rest of the country or will some of the intolerance of the rest of the country come into New York? I think New York City is an incredible place. It's almost like the Mesopotamia of the planet here. We have every, every race, every ethnicity, uh, over 100 plus languages in Queens alone if I'm not mistaken. It's incredible to see the diversity here. It's our strength, no doubt. Um, I think, unfortunately, with this topic, and I have to tell you, in my classroom, there is not one hotter topic than immigration. It affects everyone. It affects people you know, people you don't know, your friends, uh, people that you've heard of. And I think all of us are compassionate people. So when I hear a story like the Assemblywoman's, it's very inspiring. And I know a lot of other dreamers. So a lot of my students didn't know they were dreamers until they went to apply for, for financial aid <laughs> and found out. I remember uh, vividly students telling me, you have no idea, professor. I had no idea I was here illegally until I wasn't able to acquire financial aid. 
But because it's such a sensitive topic, I really feel that there are extremes out there that are really muddying the waters. They're really not making a debate possible. They're not allowing us to have a conversation. You have on one end uh, an administration that is hell-bent on, on stopping even legal immigration, who I became a never Trumper when he attacked Mexicans on June 16th, 2015. When he attacked the way he did, the way his administration is attacking people uh, that look like me and people that don't. As a compassionate person, I'm concerned. So you have the Trump administration on one extreme, and then we have to have the conversation, Bob. You started the show throwing bombs, everything about, you know, or, or anything that was against or pushing back a little bit on immigration, you came out hard against. We have another extreme, and the extreme is we have to abolish ICE, we have to uh, open the border, no more deportations. I see it because I work with these professors in my department. I'm the only Republican in the center, right? So I hear this two extremes, the Trump extreme and the no more deportations extreme, and you know what happens? Everything else gets muddied, and we're not able to have an honest, sensible discussion as to the dangers of undocumented immigration, the new class of people that are in the United States that we're not discussing that are being paid pennies on the dollar and being abused, and those are the undocumented immigrants. We're not having those conversations because the extremes are polarizing and they're not letting us have a, 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 a real honest debate. We're afraid to have it, and I think it's unfair. That's a great, it's a very good point because I think that if the Democratic Party doesn't come up with some kind of an overall program and simply says no more ice. And you know what happens? They just uh, uh, throw out ice, the next day dry ice appears, and you have another, it's just an agency, it's the policy. But if you don't talk about the limits of this and what it means, I think the, the Republican Party is gonna say the Democrats are all for open borders, open borders. And that is not a very good is issue, uh, especially in places like North South Dakota or Kansas. Uh, and in general, the Midwest down, especially also in the South. And it's very important uh, that we have that conversation. I personally think that we need to increase immigration for a number of reasons, but especially concentrating on the dreamers, which I think is a no-brainer uh, decision to be made. Uh, you know, you, you have some screening going on, but nonetheless, and we need to deal with undocumented immigrants. But, uh, I mean, just to throw open the whole thing is just not going to be a good thing to do politically. You but so much, of this also, so much of this is also economics. I mean, the, the Mississippi chicken plant raid is an example. And there was another one several years ago in an Iowa meatpacking house, a kosher meatpacking house. How much businesses depend on immigrants Including undocumented, un un including undocumented, especially in this city. It is not in the economic best interest of a lot of businesses for us to actually have an overhaul in our immigration system. I have to say, I actually agree with you in this whole thing of, of no... Rationalizing this Yeah, system. the idea that defunding ICE is what's going to fix our immigration system, to me, is ridiculous. As a lawyer who remembers history and remembers that we used to have something called INS, and we did away with INS, and all of a sudden we have ICE, and we have other agencies, until we overhaul the actual immigration laws of this country, it doesn't matter what label we give the agency. It doesn't matter if we fund it, defund it. We will not have a system that truly recognizes the economics of it, the political of it, and the humanity of our immigrants. So right now, I will give you an example. In our district, we have 13 women who are immigrants, some of them are undocumented, some of them are documented, who have been defrauded by their employer, who have had their wages stolen. And the reason why this employer continues to do this to more and more immigrants is because these are immigrant and many of them undocumented women in need. Businesses depend on that. Businesses depend on their way of, of doing things is let's steal from this immigrant and this one's not going to do anything, let's get another one and then let's get another one and let's get another one. And these are the same folks who will go and donate to campaign campaigns that will keep the same kind of people in power that will ensure that we're not going to have an overhaul in our immigration system. Uh, to kind of ping out the assembly member's point too, I think it's partly an issue here is a change in both mindset and oversight structures, which is that, you know, ICE and CBP and all these, these things were put into Homeland Security following the creation of that department, which was used as a direct injustice. result of 9-11. And, you know, it used to be kind of under the Department of Justice where there was much more rigorous kind of an, of an oversight structure. Once you put it into Homeland Security, A, it's sort of in the umbrella of all the other anti-terror stuff. So it's a change in mindset. And B, there, it's, it's much muddier in terms of like who can really 
you know, perform that, that kind of an oversight. It's a more opaque department of the government. The second thing I want to say is that, um, you know, as far as the economic issue, you know, uh, the, the assembly member's right in that it's a lot of the same people who are kind of railing against, you know, undocumented immigration and at the same time basically Benefiting. relying on, on, that, on that labor for their businesses. And the president is obviously the most famous example, but there are certainly others. And, and the, the pathways that exist for those labor needs to be met for example, the H-2A agricultural visa, which is a temporary work visa for, for you know, farm workers used a lot here in New York. I mean, it's a mess. The, the program's a disaster. It doesn't work. And, you know, people use it out of necessity. But, it, but if there were, you know, actual pathways for some of these employment needs and labor needs to be met, people would use them. But, but by and large, you know, the, the, the pathways that exist are... Except that even some of the legal, the, H, the H-1B or HB-1 visas where... Basically, a worker has almost no rights because yeah. they're dependent. Right. Yeah. You know, they can be deported if they uh, upset their boss. If they so, complain, they're blacklisted. But, you know, we also, you know, you know, talking about the economics, I mean, this is very complicated. Immigration is totally tied in with the economy. When, when you know, in the years after the North American Free Trade Act was passed, which uh, created jobs in Mexico on the southern side of the border, you had, you had a safety valve. People had a place to work in Mexico, didn't come up here for economic reasons, setting aside the asylum <clears> argument. <throat> and as you, you know, punish the country south of the border and damage them, because we are the 800-pound gorilla in the Americas, you, you almost put pressure on them to, Bob, uh, to come here. Bob, you know, you're, you're feeling to, to, to at least mention that we've invested heavily in Latin America. We're looking only at the south, but a lot of the undocumented immigration is coming from Asia. It's coming from yes, other parts, yes, not yes, just. I yes, mean, that's correct. For some reason, we just focus on Latin America. That's fine. We'll do it for a little bit here. Well, it's because of the it's 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 but, because of the president's rhetoric that's I, focused. I, on. I know, and that's unfortunate. And, and I agree we, with we you. cannot allow those types of extremists to really not allow for us to have a discussion on all undocumented immigration. So when we look well, at the Chinese, investment, well, it's Chinese, yeah, Mexicans, and and and, and, and Russians. I mean, you have every group on the planet would like to come here, and many of them would like to cut the line. You mentioned, Professor, that there are four million people waiting to come here legally. Those are four million people that have paid, waiting. They're getting their backgrounds checked. We're making sure we know who they are before they come here. And then you tell someone you can simply just uh, cross over. You can take a visa, extend the visa. You can do all sorts of things to, to cut the line. And we have to figure this out. Americans don't want to hear about that anymore. Americans are not comfortable with the fact that people are cutting the lines and there are 4 million people waiting to come in and we have 11 million people that are here undocumented. They just don't. I know it sounds terrible, but we have a country that elected in 2016 someone who was incredibly anti-immigrant, not just undocumented, any kind of immigrant. The, the country's well, telling us... some kinds of... That, yeah, well, the country's yeah. yelling loud and clear, do something about this issue. Because when you talk about economics, you're not talking about the 26 states that border the southern border, that sued President Obama because of DACA that I support, and DAPA, which I support, sued him because they're spending billions of dollars in social services. DACA is, yep. is the, these 26 the states, preferred... The, yeah, these 26 states sued the President uh, Obama's administration because he issued an executive order that would have an incredible burden on those 26 states that are spending billions of dollars on hospitals, schools, and other social services. Look, these citizens don't want to pay for that. The people that live in those 26 states, they're part of our democracy. And they're saying, you have to do something about this. Simply allowing all these people here without any sort of check is unfair. And it sounds hard for us in New York because, as I mentioned earlier, we're so diverse and we're so open-minded. When you get further down there, it's not as open-minded. And a lot of people are suffering because not only are they losing their jobs, because people are being exploited. Assemblywoman, you said that these businesses are dependent. They're exploiting these undocumented immigrants. And they're paying them much less than they would an American citizen. And they're taking advantage of that. So what you have you, a lot of anger. What in would you do? I would absolutely. First thing I would do is allow for dreamers to be legalized. Yeah, I think we Abs all agree. That's no, a, absolutely. No brainer. You would think so. But would you believe that we had that in our hands? And because yeah. the extremists were let in, we don't have dreamers legalized anymore. Yeah, I know. That was actually available. Then what you do is that you have to do something about closing the border. Now, it sounds tough. But Americans want, repeatedly, polls show, Americans want to do something about closing the border and taking care of the people that we already have. Whatever that process is, whether it's a, you'll never be a citizen, but you'll be a legalized green card holder, I think that's something that we should be able to talk about, honestly. But simply deporting 11 million people is unfair. It's insane. It's ridiculous. It's inhumane. We did that with Operation Bootstrap, not at that level. 
But, I mean, we have to be honest and have the discussion as to the 11 million that are here undocumented that are a heavy burden on many states that don't have the ability to pay for these things. I mean, I think the part of the conversation that hasn't, that often gets lost is that those 11 million people, we're contributing to the economy of every single state we're living in. It is, it, and we can't even benefit from it. So there's this whole notion that often gets repeated that we are taking from the state coffers, we're taking from the state coffers, we're getting this benefit, but we're not. None of us, when I was undocumented, when my mother was undocumented, none of us could apply for any of those state benefits. But, yet, you, but you pay taxes. Yet we paid the taxes and we paid into the system and you're looking at millions and millions of dollars. So you're right, we have to have a frank conversation but that needs to be a part of it that conversation needs to have that understanding that we do not qualify for any of these social services that they were suing for we can't actually get them but we are contributing this is that whole notion that i think you as a republican would agree with you can't have taxation without representation in this country and that is what 11 million undocumented immigrants continue to have and i can guarantee That's a true you assemblywoman because they count towards the census Right? To this, this day, time. they count towards the census. Not they this they, time they do. Like they, they as of today, That's they the do. Only. No, as That's of today, the, they, the undocumented immigrants do count towards the census and they do get representation because you have a lot of uh, Congress members in California who are representing districts that have many undocumented immigrants that count towards the 720,000 in the population. Provided. So that's not technically fair. Just, Professor, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just going to get the thing about the line, though, and I, because if we're going to have a productive conversation, I just think that like that's one of the things that we can't let What's slide. That? What's that? The, you know, you, you mentioned the line and waiting in line? line multiple yeah, times. Yeah, that's true. There's no line, though. We, that's true. Know, the professor though, mentioned that, 4 million people four million waiting. Wait, let him go. That's a fact. Right, but that, that's 4 million people in very, very limited set pathways. You know, we're going to talk about, like, opportunity for everyone to kind of... If you, if you let all four million in today, believe me, there'd be four million or more. It's, it's great. We have amnesties and the you know, numbers go up again. It's just as right. long as the desire is to come to the United States, you're going right. to get these lines. And when you have a line and that, you're going to have people who want to cross it. But there's only a line for people who actually could qualify for these uh, these guidelines. But there's four, four categories of there's legal no, immigration. Yeah, but there the is a States. line. Okay, good, right. There, good. There, there is employment based, nuclear family, uh, humanitarian protections, and diversity lottery, which is tiny, almost not even right. worth talking about. So if you're just Joe Schmo in wherever, right? I mean, if you're just a person sitting in you know, Sweden, since that gets a lot of play these days with the president, but like, and you just want to immigrate to the United States, there's no line for you to wait in, right? There's no- yeah, But the line is figurative, Felipe. Yeah. I mean, there is a, when we say line, we mean there's a there's yeah, but a, a lot of people believe and people are when you say it. that, a lot of people but what, what you're visualize saying is, some but there's kind a process of by which the United States, we are a republic democracy, we have decided that these are going to be how we're going to be allow people in. And our country is very generous. We have over a million legalized uh, uh, people that have become citizens in the United States to immigrate to the United States. That's a lot of people. We're a generous 1. country. 1.1 right? million people have come legally in the United States legally. the last two years. Yeah, for that, that's amazing. That's so, the terminology uh, No, but important. that's important. No, I'm, not, I'm saying it is important. Uh, but if important. I say line, I mean, obviously the people are not standing in line across the ocean. I'm saying figuratively, <laughs> there are people that have put in and they're waiting. And you know what? The American people have said, these are going to be our laws. And somehow, there are groups in the United States who says, ah, who cares about these laws? You know what? My family needs to get here. And I am very compassionate, I understand. But you cannot disregard the law because it's just cumbersome. I mean, we disregard it every time we go meddle in foreign policies, and that's why we end up with people who need to come to this country to actually look for help. And that's the thing that I think often, uh, and I'll call them the people from the United States because America is actually a continent. Um, the people that live in the United States often forget that over 20, 30, 40 years, we decided, oh, we have actual money that could be made in some of these countries. Let's go meddle in their politics, in their economy, and we create the kinds of storms that lead to these folks coming to our borders and asking for help. And it's often these countries that we exclude from this so proverbial line. We excluded, I mean, the last time we tried to ban people, we included Venezuela, which we had a hand at. We included Colombia, which we had a hand at. We included Central America, which we had a hand at. And so we can't be that arrogant that we're going to go mess another country up and when their people want to come get our help, we're like, mm, not my problem. That can't be That's the country right. that we are. Look, I understand that Professor, I mean, Juan Gonzalez, a journalist, former Daily News journalist, wrote an incredible book, yeah. Harvest of Empire, which I use in my class. And he says a lot to what you said, Assemblywoman, that our, our, our meddling in, in a lot of the affairs of Central America and South America, Latin America in general, has created an environment 
where a lot of people are coming here undocumented. I think th that argument is loud and clear. But we've been involved in Latin America for a very long time. Some very good. I know that it's very easy for a lot of groups to just trash our involvement in Latin America. I know we have incredible hospitals in the Dominican Republic because of the investment of the United States. We have a lot of people, a lot of investment in Mexico and in Central America because of the United States, because we are a generous country. There are some things that were bad. We supported some bad governments. It's true. I mean, that's, that's without, without fault. But in 1986, we, we did have an amnesty plan that allowed for 3 million people that were here undocumented to be legalized. But since then, we have another 11 million so people that are meddling. undocumented. No, no. Me, to, I, I, the way you say meddling just completely ignores the investment that America has made that has been positive. We have made incredible contributions to Latin America. That's like and, saying and, and because... It's true, though. But that's like but saying because I invested, I now get to go tell you what to do with your country. It's, I never it's just, said that. No, but I'm you're... saying there's good things we've done. That's all I said. But that doesn't excuse the bad ones. I didn't say that. I'm saying that we, we have done some very good things because it's easy for Mr. Gonzalez, and I use the book in my class, and it's very hard. You mentioned like my polar <laughs> teaching this stuff and thinking this way. But we, we have to remember and be cognizant. We are a great country. We're very generous. And Latin America has benefited incredibly. Look, if and then we if we're so good... bad, if we're so awful, why are millions trying to get in? And, and, I, and I completely agree. Why? If we were so bad, I wouldn't be here. I'd be living right. in Canada with, right now. But right. we are a great country. And because we are a great country, we really need to analyze our own behavior, understand where we have messed up, and actually have the compassion that you have actually expressed. We cannot be the kind of country that ignores, that only looks at that good, but ignores the bad we have done, and says, you know what? It's okay to have children in cages and use them against their parents. That is not That's the kind of country ignorance. we can be. That's absolutely true. Can do that. Yeah. All right. A so a couple of points. Uh, NAFTA, the great trade agreement, did uh, hit the Mexican economy, and it really drove many small farmers out of business who then came uh, north. I mean, foreign trade goes different ways mm -hmm. and so forth, which Mr. Trump doesn't seem to understand. And the question about uh, undocumented, the problem here is that many people pay local, they, they are living in locales, and they pay FICA. And in other words, they pay federal money. So the money goes to Washington, and they are using schools, local hospitals, roads, fire protection, and so there's an imbalance. One easy solution would be to me, to give those states which are highly impacted by immigration some federal kind of kind of money. Occasionally, this is done, but not not really from that standpoint. But your point about uh, we have to have borders. I think it's an illusion. It is. I don't think we're ever going to have really secure borders. We have seven th several thousand miles in the south, several thousand miles in the north. Uh, out, the government calls the people who are not immigrants non-immigrants. There may be a million foreign students. They may be a million of your H-2s and all the other temporary workers going in. Uh, above all, they are tourists who come in uh, for 90 days and travel around, and some of them disappear and become undocumented uh, immigrants. And, and they're also, uh, our borders are very, very loose. You build a wall, but we have, we created in the 1920s, three million border crossing card, cards. And these can be easily forged. It gives a person a right to cross the border to shop, but not work. Everybody knows who give these cards. Uh, it's a kind, of, a kind of an abuse. And we also allow immigrants, that is, people have green cards, or U.S. citizens live in Mexico or Canada and cross daily to work. And so you have hundreds of millions of crossings in the United States. And I, I guess the problem to get all of this under control would make us a, some kind of a police state. I just don't see... I don't see another kind of solution there. We can tighten up, we can build walls, we can do a lot more with, I think we can do a lot more with employment, and especially employers uh, using an e-verification system uh, for that. Uh, but we had, when the am first amnesty went in, 3,000 employees on the border. We now have 20,000. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security is really the biggest growth department uh, we have in the last 30 years, and it has not stopped it. I mean, it's a very difficult problem, and it inevitably is going to turn loose uh, a number of people who are not too careful about other person's lives. So the, it's a very sorry kind of situation. I don't know really if there's any, any way out. Some people have suggested temporary worker programs. Uh, the problem with some of those is that they uh, lead to abuses, and, and the workers don't have, have much. I have, a, we've been, since I retired, we go up to Vermont in the summer, we stay up there, and the dairy farmers want workers because the kids don't want to work in, in the dairy farms when it's 20 below zero in Vermont. 
So they are employed, employing uh, Mexicans, but they are without documents. But the sh local sheriff in the town of Middlebury and other communities know that the dairy industry is crucial. So they will not pick people up. They let it go. And, and uh, various people around, this, you go in the grocery store, you can tell who's buying what. And you can tell in the fall when the Jamaicans come in with a, a legal temporary worker permit to harvest apples. So there are various ways to deal with this situation, but I just, <laughs> studying over over the years, thinks it's always going to be messy. And we're very lucky if we can come out with a, you know, some kind of a, a control kind of situation, but I just don't expect uh, utopias, uh, utopias. And I, I think our present policy of family unification and 140,000 places for people with skills uh, are the best. I'm more dubious about the lottery. It's not a very good way to uh, point, uh, bring immigrants in. And we have to do something about the southern border. But, you know, if you suddenly clear up the border problem, what's going to stop 10 more years for another war bringing people? I mean, we're just going to have to live with this. Good. And, and it's not easy unless you want to go in an armed garrison police state like Eastern Europe had uh, from the 1950s down to 1989. That's where you want to live. Uh, I've been in Eastern Europe when the, when the communists were under control, and believe me, they were under control. First thing you do is grab your passport if you're staying at a hotel and keep it. I've said enough. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, the, I mean, kind of the, okay. So let's say that we want people to follow legal pathways. We don't want people to immigrate undocumented. All right, let's part from that premise. Okay, so today, September 25th, uh, the third version of the Muslim ban in effect, total asylum ban in the border in effect, public charge going into effect in 20 days, which allows people to be denied entry and or residency if they, not only if they have used public benefits, but if a bureaucrat in USAS deems that they're likely to use public benefits at any point in the future, it's an unappealable decision. All of the employment visa categories are a disaster. And the, the administration is close to setting its refugee cap for fiscal 2020, which some are advocating to be zero, flat zero. <coughs> no refugee resettlement whatsoever. So if we say that we, you know, we want there to be sort of legal pathways to resettlement, and those pathways have to exist, right? I mean, can we agree on that? The pathways need of to course. be real. And so, you know, it, it seems like the discussion, I mean, it, it, it it's kind of hard to have this discussion when, you know, you're advocating, certain people are advocating for this population to kind of like gain some sort of, you know, legal right to stay or whatever else, while at the same time, almost every avenue well, you've, is closed. Felipe, you've mentioned several things that I don't agree with that this administration mm -hmm. is pushing. And the first thing I said when we sat here was that they're extremists. And they unfortunately have won this election and they're pushing things that I don't agree with. Mm -hmm. He surrounded himself with guys like Stephen Miller, Miller who, make, yeah. who disgust me with their policies. So I don't agree with a lot of the things that you just threw out there. Um, my argument is that, and it's a very honest argument, most, almost every country on the planet decides its laws. They decide who comes in. They decide who comes in and how they come in. The Dominican Republic, where my parents are from, have a big problem with Haiti right now. I've written a lot about it. A lot of it is racial. A lot of it has to do with history. But they've decided that they're going to allow people to come into the country that have, com that have A, B, C, and D. When you go to Mexico, Mexico has a very hard issue right now with Honduras. And at their border, they're fighting off Central Americans that are coming in illegally. They've decided A, B, C, and D. We go to other parts of Europe, you can't even become a citizen unless you have their blood in your system. We go everywhere else. All countries on the planet have decided who gets into their country and how, A, B, C, and D. We also have decided. We said this is how We're you get not into every other No, 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 but anymore. but what wait, 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 you can't do that. You cannot dismiss the notion that we are a country of laws by saying we're special though. We are a special country. We're very generous, like I said, but you have to uh, uh, appreciate and respect our laws. And I think that anyone who says that we don't have to is sending the wrong message. And if you think you're gonna win an election and get 270 electoral votes by decriminalizing undocumented immigration, you're out of your mind, and you're gonna get Trump for four more years pushing this extremist policy, and we're gonna be sitting here saying, Polanco, you were right. We had to fight- we're talking to... about aren't laws. No, these, you things know, are, I mean, these things are things that the president gets to decide because the Congress has given him the power to decide them. Absolutely. <laughs> he decides who comes in. If he decides he doesn't want people from several countries who happen to be predominantly Muslim, the Supreme Court has said he can do that. Yeah. That's a fact. Well, because he put the well, that's one Supreme Court, but, but I mean, everything else is in litigation, I, I, but it's I think, still in effect. I think one in the of meantime. the things uh, I think you're an attorney as well, yes. right? We have to stop saying decriminalizing immigration. 
criminal laws and immigration laws are completely different. One is civil, one is criminal. I think we have to part from that. Not anymore, I agree. Assembly Well, women. the way that they're treating us is like criminals, but in the law, the way that it's written, one is a civil matter, one is a criminal matter. The way that they're mm -hmm. treating us, I agree with you, they're treating it like it's criminal law. I mean, they should give us attorneys under the Constitution if that's how they're going to treat it. But that's another conversation. But I think we have to, I, I agree with you. As a lawyer, I think that each country gets to choose their laws. But we have a history, a history of a country that was created by immigrants, the soul of a country that was created by immigrants. And if we're not going to put that as part of the actual process, then why are we here? As part of the process of what are we going to do with this country and the 11 million, actually it's probably closer to 15 million people who are undocumented in this country, we have to think about the soul of the country that created us. It's every single one of those countries that you're talking about that chose its laws. A lot of them are coming here looking for a better life, whether because we meddled or whether because there's war, or whether because there's poverty, whatever the reason is, it's them fleeing to us. So if we're not going to sit here and actually think about the soul of the nation, which are the immigrants in this country, and how do we treat them humanely, and how do we actually continue to grow it? Because if we close all our borders or we put laws that actually create this proverbial line that turns 4 million to 10 million people, we're going to die off and we're going to just become one of those countries countries. And we don't want to be one of those countries. We're different than them. Um, before I go to questions, I want to ask you quickly. I don't want to ignore the census question. Um, oh. which all is, uh, My I district mean, actually is going to be the hardest hit in the entire state. Well, because, but do you think undocumented immigrants will take part in the census or is the fear going to keep them from filling out those forms? You want the political answer or the real answer? Both. I think the political answer is I'm going to do everything in my power, and that's my work answer. I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure people are counted. But I got to tell you, I am very concerned that this president and his minions and, and the people that work for him and the administration that decided that this was a good idea are going to get their way because people are terrified. People are terrified that simply answering a question is going to tear them apart from the only country they know as home. And so I'm not very confident. I, I, I think we're probably going to lose a seat or two in New York. I, I am actually, um, after speaking to several folks that know more about this issue than I do, it seems like my district is going to be one, of, one or if not the hardest hit district in the entire state when it comes to being undercounted. And, you know, we're out, I actually, I was out, out yesterday at the train stations giving out information saying, remember that the census is coming next year. But people are afraid, and rightly so. Yes, ma'am, tell us your name and your campus and speak up, please. I'm Olivia Frasca. I go to the College of Staten Island. Um, and I wanted to know with election season um, clearly on the way, how do you think the 2020 presidential candidates have been approaching the immigration crisis, especially in what we've seen in the Democratic debates? Um, you want to, I mean, go ahead. You, can, I think, I you think jump and then we'll, yeah, and I think then we'll jump on you. Look. <laughs> I'm very practical. I know J.C. a long time. I, I I'm a centrist with these issues, and I'm very honest. You know, this president won this election with little less than 70,000 votes. That's the MetLife Stadium, okay, in three states. Well, he lost by three and a half million. Yeah, but that, again, that doesn't matter. That's not how we elect our president. Right. We've decided that. But what we need is, in, in order to defeat Trump, you need, you need Michigan, you need Pennsylvania, you need Wisconsin. He came within less than a point of winning Minnesota and New Hampshire. Those are some real facts here. We're talking about maybe a few people in New Hampshire and Minnesota. This is an even further victory in the Electoral College. I am afraid that from what I hear in the Democratic primary uh, debate for president on this issue of immigration is one that is going to guarantee that those states vote the same way again. You're not going to win those three states. You're not going to win middle America by telling people that you have no problem offering full, full health insurance to people that have violated our laws. That's not going to happen. The question of driver's licenses hasn't even come up yet. But when the rest of the country realizes that there are two or three states, including New York, who have allowed for people who are undocumented to have driver's licenses, which are legal... I tell you, no, no, I, a huge, no, no. Right. That's a huge issue. When guys in Pennsylvania, in Western Pennsylvania, where moderate Democrats beat Republicans, that's how they got the majority, when they discover that this is coming in their state, you're not going to be able to win this election, and that's something you need to know. You're going to drive up the numbers in New York yeah, and California, that, but you're not going to win those states. That issue is cutting your nose to spite your face. No, that's not, yeah, that's I, not true. Just, just, just a minute. That's an issue of symbolism as opposed to substance, and it's an example of the way the, that this president is playing on the fears of a reality, which is that this country is on its way 
to being, this is an oxymoron, a majority-minority country. Just the way this city is a majority-minority city, and that changed the politics in this city. And I have to agree with you, because having been front and center on the fight for driver's licenses in, in, in New York... Why wouldn't we, you want to know who's driving? I just want... You didn't give me a chance, Bob. You said that it was populism. I cut my nose, no, no, no. my face. It's a symbol. It's, it's, it. it's, it's, it's an issue of symbol. I don't want them to have a license and insurance. You yeah. know what's interesting about this? And I'm sorry, but this is a, a fact. Yeah. I've had clients lose their licenses because they didn't pay their child support. Do you know what? When you are an undocumented uh, immigrant here, and 99.9% are wonderful people, if you're watching, that's my position, okay? But you haven't gone through the background check. We don't know who you are. We don't know what your background in driving you is. Know we don't know if you... Oh, no, excuse me. That's not true. Wait, hold up. That's not true. That, wait, wait. <laughs> you have not gone through the proper process for us to know if you have owe child support. We don't know if you have drunk driving records. We don't know anything. That in a man, that's not true. If you're coming in on undocumented, you have not gone through the process. So these people... You have a license, they'll know. But these people that are coming <laughs> undocumented... I think that's where he's going. But these people that are coming undocumented without any documents at all, and they come to New York, they're now at an advantage. Because we don't know anything about... They can owe monies to the states and judicial judgments. We don't know anything because they haven't gone through the background. But here in the United States, in order for you to get a license and you're a citizen, you have to make sure that you have no judicial judgments that you owe. You have to make sure your child support is up to date. You have to make sure that you have uh, no DWIs or any other felonies in your background that would have prevented you from getting a license. I think those are real issues that we don't want to talk about because we're so compassionate, but I hope in this forum well, we're both compassionate I'm arguing and practical. Rationally. I think it's a rational issue, not you, a... You compassion. think it's rational for people that we don't know who, what their background is as far as driving? Wait, 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 wait. Because... <laughs> The, this is like an entire other. Well, this is what it's. Right, right. Bob, no, for the viewers, Bob loves drama, <laughs> and <laughs> and this is not scripted. And I think that this is great for us. To, I'm just mentioning the fact that the Democratic primary is very important, mm -hmm. and you need to connect to Middle America. And when you start being a little too far left on issues to appease to a base, you're going to lose out. But this out. is a country of extremes. You get the kind of extreme that instills fear and that points every single bad thing that happens in this nation onto immigrants. Oh, it must have been an immigrant's fault. Oh, it must have been an immigrant. And so that's how we ended up with the president that we have now, because we ended up blaming and everything on immigrants. He capitalized on that. He fundraised on that. He married that, but that's another issue. And we end up now where we are. And so what we, I partially agree with you, but I, I think the answer to that is to have an immigration plan, a candidate with a realistic immigration plan. I've actually made an endorsement because I, I, of, of Elizabeth Warren because I actually think that her immigration plan is that much more realistic than other ones I've seen out there. Because I think you have to be, in certain aspects, you have to be pragmatic. And I like to see the nation understand that it's amazing to run in poetry, but you can't always govern in poetry. You actually have to govern in prose at times, and you actually have to be more pragmatic and understand that if we keep on having these extremes, we're going to end up with Trump all over again. By yes, the way, do, do you yes. know why Trump really wants to send them back? He wants to get rid of his wife and in-laws. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean that. I mean that. And he could, he could divorce his wife and then take up with some 30-year-old, but the damn in-laws would still be there. So you, you send him back and tell the State Department, no visa. I didn't know he was going to. And boy, that's, can he have fun in the White House. I think we have another that's question. The, that's the joke that I will not make, which is that uh, the fact that two of his wives are immigrants proves that there's certain jobs Americans won't do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, ma'am. My name is Leona Bryce, and I attend Medgar Evers College. Documented immigrant, immigrants are also being threatened and ridiculed. As a college student trying to move forward with my career, what process is being done so I could come, so it could calm my fears as I move forward in life. I mean, I assume what you're saying is that even documented immigrants suffer from the discrimination that's put on to undocumented immigrants and the people who are doing the discriminating are making no distinction. That's, that's very real. I think that's part of um, the ignorance that has been empowered by this presidency where we have... Um, someone that can say, oh, I see you, you must be undocumented because of the way you look, 
There's no distinction because of, of your, because of your accent. There's no distinction between who's documented or who's not documented. You can't tell. I mean, when I was undocumented, you couldn't tell that I was undocumented. I've had the same semi Brooklyn accent my entire life, and so Brooklyn people don't have an accent. Yes, we do. <laughs> Everybody. Well, else I'm does. from Queens now, so okay. it's it's okay. gone. Okay. Uh, and so one of the things that we're doing is working with state agencies, with city agencies, to make sure that people understand their rights. That regardless of whether you're documented documented, undocumented, just arrived, or been here for 20 years. There are constitutional protections. There are state laws that protect you. There are city laws that protect you. And we're working with them to make sure that they're actually functioning, because we can promise you the world, but if the city and the state agencies are not talking to each other or are not working the way that they need to, you're not going to get the protections that you need. And so I think a lot of it is education, because even you as citizens don't understand their rights. And so we have to make sure that we're out there. And I, I know several of my colleagues and myself as an elected, we go out there all the time to talk to people about their education rights, their housing rights, that are all intersectional, because many of us are in these low-wage working immigrant communities that are affected whether you're documented or not. If I could just actually offer one like direct personal advice, which is that like in these scenarios, employers tend to get very skittish if they don't really understand what's going on, and like you should really be very well read on like you know what people can do for you, and if they're like, oh, we don't really deal with that, don't don't let that happen. Like you have to be very you, you know, know self advocate. Right. And don't let them get away with just kind of not understanding what's going on. Yes, sir. Good evening. My name is uh, Justin Freeman. I'm from Brooklyn College. This is sort of a history and a political question. Um, along the lines of uh, American exceptionalism and foreign policy, American hegemony during the Cold War and the war on drugs has caused us to support murderous and corrupt dictators that have created situations in which asylum seekers have sought refuge in the United States. Um, what are historians, or are, are historians acknowledging these events when analyzing the history of immigration? And are politicians keeping this history in mind when creating future immigration policy? Um, America, it's, the, it's the point that we've made, I think, which is that American policies, whether it's trade policy, whether it's the kind of interventions in Latin America or interventions in African countries, has caused people to flee those, those countries. If you, if you destroy the homeland, they're going to try to come here. We're still, you know, for all the stuff that's been going on, there is a perception around the world for many, many people that we are still the last best hope for where you, for where you want to come. Um, you're the historian on the panel. Well, I would say that the belief that America is exceptional is by and large uh, going out among us. It's been going out for a number of years. I mean, it, just, it just, if you read what uh, historians are saying, they just don't believe. It's a lot of nonsense, frankly. And, uh, and as for immigration historians, they're all very liberal and pro-immigrants, no doubt about it. Uh, Alan Krauts finished a new book on nativism. Uh, Erica Lee's got a book coming out in November uh, on the crusade against immigration. My colleague at NYU, Hasia Diner's got a new book coming out a uh, uh, new history of just immigration rather generally. I know all the, these three people, and believe me, they're not going <laughs> to not, not going to take an anti-immigrant point of view. You'll be able to see it when you you read this. I think that's a drift of what's going on. American exceptionalism is, is something I detest, but I think in general the profession is moving against it. How can you not? You know, the, the Mexican War was a, a steal, and the atrocities were done. The Spanish-American War, and then we took a two-year, two and a half bloody war to to conquer the Philippines afterwards and so forth and so on. And we live with slavery, we're the largest slave country in the world by 1860s, you know, in the Western Hemisphere at least. And, uh, you know, there are just too many of these things that are uh, things that are, that are really there. I'm just reading at home today the uh, new history of Reconstruction. It's not a nice history. And I would say shortly that um, politicians are public servants, like I like to call myself, the good ones, we have it in mind. We keep it in mind because we understand that unless we know our history, we're not going to be able to move forward. The bad ones, like the one we have in the presidency, choose exactly what they want to remember and what they want to change. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Nyla Phillips. I am from Mega Everest College. My question is, from a compassionate standpoint, how can we implement more programs and centers at CUNY for our undocumented students for them to feel safe? 
Well, well, CUNY is particularly welcome. I don't know what the numbers are of uh, immigrant students at CUNY. I suspect it's very high, and I suspect that there's a large number of undocumented students at CUNY. Um, um, does anybody want to tackle that? I mean, I think most CUNYs are safe spaces. Most CUNYs are safe. I know that BMCC a few years ago uh, made it very loud and clear that it would be a safe haven and a safe space for students to come mm -hmm. in, a sanctuary college. I think is and what many it was of the schools are opening up Im uh, immigrant centers. Uh, I think Brooklyn opened one, John Jay opened one, and I, w my colleagues and I are going to be advocating to ensure that there's one in every CUNY because there needs to be a recognition that we're at every single CUNY. There's even many of us who are teaching, who are uh, assistant professors with DACA that we want to make sure that they feel supported. But it isn't just about having the center there. One of the things that happened to me when I was at John Jay is that I, the resources exist but I didn't know they were there because nobody was actually coming to me and telling me that they were there. There's this expectation that because I'm a part of the campus that I somehow have the time on top of my two jobs to pay the tuition that I had to pay because I was undocumented to actually go get a re the resources. So one of the things I'm going to be urging CUNY is to do a better job at actually putting out the information that the resources are there because many of us don't have the time to go to the resources. The resources have to come to us. One of the other points is that you know, dating back to the Koch administration and the Koch order, which said that city agencies will not cooperate, will not turn in undocumented immigrants who report a crime, because obviously you want them to report a crime, will not turn in an undocumented immigrant who goes to a hospital, because you obviously don't want the spread of communicable diseases. It's kind of like the, you know, in my argument um, about the driver's license, there's a, there's a sensible way that you have to live from today to tomorrow, and it's much the same as CUNY. And now you see it with the resistance pretty wide resistance among city and state agencies and courthouses, et cetera, law now. et cetera. It used to be an executive order. It's, it's a law now. I, 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 think it's an, I actually think it's an untested law because I'm not sure to what degree federal preemption ultimately wouldn't Are you succeed. referring to the sanctuary city issue? Is that what yeah. you're referring to? No, no, no. I'm, it's a more practical. I'm, you know, I'm not doing a broader thing of sanctuary city. I'm just saying about the lack of cooperation, saying, I mean, it's tied into being a sanctuary right, city, yeah, but it's the practical effect of trying to get from today right. to tomorrow. I'd say, I mean, I think CUNY is pretty good with this already, but in education writ large, it's very important to have information sharing in mind because it happens all the time that like some school resource officer or somebody will write, jot down a note that they suspect that X or Y may be involved in the gang or whatever. And the fact of the matter is for a lot of these immigration related determinations, the government doesn't really get much evidence at all to be able to have someone be considered ineligible for adjustment of status or whatever else if there's like something on their record anywhere where they're suspected of having had you know gang involvement or something so like I think in education that's one of the bigger issues like being very careful not to put something on someone's record that would have an impact on the line even if that was not something that you know the person intended when they when they wrote that down yes Good evening. My name is Wesley Duarte. Um, I'm a student at York College, and my question to the five of you is, unfortunately, there wasn't enough discussion on DACA tonight. Um, there was that brief discussion on the states that have, that have um, attempted to declare it unconstitutional. So my question is, I was hearing a lot about this conversation about cutting the imaginary line. Um, what about those who cut the line with unintentionally, like those DACA recipients who were brought to the United States as very young children? Obviously, they're not old enough to make that decision on their own. So, would so my question is like, would they be considered cutting the line as well? And would you would well, the five it? of you in the foreseeable future could the five of you see these DACA recipients have a pathway to citizenship? Yeah. Thank you. I mean, DACA was going to pass in 2001, as I'm ch sure you know. I mean, it was going to happen, and then, like, you know, 9-11 and, and everything else. And so, it, like, I think the problem now is that it just keeps getting tied to this other stuff, right? And then, like, every time that, like, there's a DACA bill, it's also tied to, like, dramatically cutting family reunification and all this other stuff. I think that it can happen in the next, like, few years, obviously highly dependent upon... The results of the next presidential election, but and I think congressional election, right? But it's it's among like immigration proposals. It's one of the more broadly popular. Mm -hmm. It actually has you know a lot of support from both the Republicans and the Democrats. I think the 
problem historically has been, and I have to put this on my own party, we have many Democrats who are too afraid to actually pull the trigger and do the right thing by our people because they are counting on the fact that we're always going to vote Democrat. And so I think it's time that we actually hold their feet to the fire because we deserve it, our community deserves it, and just because you have DACA does not mean you don't have any political power. The DACA movement, the Dreamer movement, has shown us that even DACA that, is deferred yeah, arrival. Defer, is, for, yeah, for, for childhood for arrival. Childhood arrival. You have shown us that even without documents, you have the political power that many other groups could only dream of. And so one of the things that I urge people is to go out and get others registered to vote so that they can vote on your behalf for the right people to be in office so that you can stand a shot at actually staying with your family. Because what they want to do now is, or what they've been wanting to do, is use your need to stay in this country to divide you from your family. The last time I ran, it's like, well, your parents or you. You can't ask me to choose between deporting my parents and actually me staying in this country. That's inhumane. And so we have to choose the kind of elected officials, be a Democrat or some Republicans who are actually supportive of this, that actually represent the needs of our community. And what our community needs is families to stay together. Um, you want to... I think DACA is one of those things that was going to happen just two years ago. It was tied to the border funding. And I don't know if you remember, there was a gentleman named Mr. Miller who got into the president's ear and said, DACA is amnesty and your base is going to hate you for it. And before you know it, the money was gone for the border and so was DACA. Um, I, I'm going to be very honest with you. I think the only way this happens is if you elect, uh, if you nominate someone who is practical on this issue. If you have a Democratic presidential nominee who goes up on that stage and says he's going to decriminalize or she's going to decriminalize immigration and what translates to open borders in today's society. And then you tell them that you're, you may not have well, health insurance. Have Wait, you may not have health insurance, but that undocumented immigrant that I'm cut the line? I'm going to cut you off, though, because I'm getting, I'm getting the we have to say goodbye sign. Okay, just remember, you can't get this done if you go too far left. Thank you all. We'll see you next time on uh, Uniform. Thank you for a spirited discussion.